Welcome to the Proceedings Podcast. I'm Bill Hamlet, the Editor-in-Chief of Proceedings at the U.S. Naval Institute. This episode is brought to you by Booz Allen. Accelerate today's missions with tomorrow's technologies as the leader in providing AI solutions to the federal government and one of the world's largest cybersecurity providers, Booz Allen advances game-changing capabilities rapidly, ethically, and securely. Learn more at boozallen.com slash defense. All right, joining me today from New London, Connecticut is Navy Captain Joel Howitt, a submarine officer and frequent contributor to proceedings and a multi-time essay contest winner of several of our essay contests. Joel, it's great to have you back to the show. Hi, Bill. Thank you. Yeah. So congratulations on your recent promotion to captain and uh, for the successful completion of your challenging tour as uh, commanding officer of the USS Toledo, uh, Los Angeles class submarine SSN 769. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, and, and now you're uh, stationed up in New London. So uh, welcome to your new uh, duty station. And, um, you know, one of the reasons your command was uh, your command tour was particularly challenging was that your entire time uh, in command of Toledo was spent in the shipyards. And uh, we've heard from many authors over the last couple of years about the difficulties of life in the shipyards, whether you're on a submarine or a surface ship or a, an aircraft carrier. Uh, life in the shipyards is not glamorous. It's hard work. It's uh, it's a lot of three section duty. It's uh, there's there's a lot of, of difficulties with it. It's not exactly what you sign up for uh, when you when you sign up for the Navy. It's not haze gray and underway. Um, and you drew on those experiences and two Hollywood movies um, about World War II. You wrote two articles that we published this month. Uh, your first piece was titled, Thanks for Everything, Mr. Roberts. And in that one, you wrote, quote, because of Mr. Roberts, I knew there are lousy jobs that must be done. I knew those lousy jobs need good leadership that builds professional pride and improves quality of life. So tell us a little bit about the book and the movie, Mr. Roberts, and the wisdom you took from them uh, as in your CO tour. All right. So there's a lot of different versions of Mr. Roberts. Uh, there's the novel that the Naval Institute prints and that I've had since I, I think I was a, I think I was an 18 year old when I bought this bill. Wow. Uh, and when the Naval Institute book star in Annapolis. Uh, nice. That was great. Um, there's the play by Thomas Hagen and uh, Joshua Logan, who uh, is known mostly for directing the musical South Pacific, which he did right after Mr. Roberts. Um, and he would co-authored the play with Thomas Hagen, the original author of Mr. Roberts. And then, of course, there's the movie uh, that came out uh, in 1955 based on the play uh, and starring a lot of the same people who were in the play, particularly Henry Fonda as Mr. Roberts. Um, and uh, this was one of those things I just realized I must have internalized at some point uh, during my command tour when one of my JOs came into my stateroom one day and asked, hey, is this really worth it? Is all the this work we're doing, this feels like we're we're running in place, is this actually worth it? And, uh, you know, as I stumbled for an answer, because of course I always would say, of course it's worth it. What we're doing is extremely meaningful, extremely worthwhile. Um, Mr. Roberts flashed into my head and I realized how much I had internalized that movie and how much I internalized that, the message of the movie and the, and the book. Um, and for your viewers, hey, they are all different. All right. The book, if you read it, is actually very different than the movie. You know, it does not have the the same ending and, and uh, it doesn't have that same uh, sort of epiphany that Mr. Roberts has about how meaningful his assignment has been. It's just something that all the other characters realize, but it doesn't really get fully fleshed out. That doesn't happen until the play. And it's even better in the movie. Um, the plot of the movie uh which is what most people will watch and what most people have seen is it's a, you know, Mr. Roberts is a person who volunteered for service when the war started, much to his frustration. He's not on a combat ship, which is where he wants to be, but instead he's on a replenishment ship, a resupply ship, the USS Reluctant. I love uh, the name of that ship. <laughs> and as he puts Reluctant. it, sail between monotony and tedium with an occasional side stop at boredom. And, uh, He's like, I'm not in the fight. And this is very frustrating to him. But he's also, he's the ship's executive officer, and he's really good at his job. And the ship, his uh, key point in the movie is that they have won this palm tree from this admiral for being the best at delivering toothpaste and toilet paper uh, and all this other stuff in the rear areas of the Western Pacific. 
And, you know, while Fonda is re- and while Mr. Roberts is really good at this, he hates it. He wants to be in the fight. And he spends a lot of the movie talking about how he wants to be in the fight. And at the same time, he's trying to take care of the crew. The captain is a terrible, terrible leader. He's denied liberty for the crew for a year. Uh, he takes credit for everything that Mr. Roberts does. Um, and for him, it's all just about winning more palm trees and being recognized more by the admiral. Um, and Roberts recognizing that the crew after a year is about to break, uh, ends up making a lot of sacrifices to win them Liberty at a, uh, port of call that essentially is Tahiti. Uh, though it's not said as much in the movie, they call it something else. Um, and he gives up, you know, he has, he's stashed a bottle of scotch, which, uh, I think after two years in the war zone would be a really hot commodity, uh, to have, he gives that to the port master in order to get them orders to go to the port. And then when they get there and the captain doesn't want to give Liberty, he, he volu- He gives up. He 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 swears he will no longer send any more tra- requests for transfer in, uh, which he's been doing every month. Uh, if in return the captain will let him, uh, will let the crew have liberty, and he also promises not to give lip to the crew, or give lip to the captain uh, anymore in front of the crew. And uh, after making all these promises, the crew gets their liberty. It's a pretty riotous uh, scene in the movie. Uh, we would hope that our sailors would not behave like this uh, <laughs> today. Um, but you could kind of understand how in 1944, 1945, sailors might be like that. Uh, and then um, afterwards, through uh, you know some comedy of errors, the crew does find out what Mr. Roberts has had to give up for them. And they end up uh, forging a captain's endorsement on his request for transfer, sending it off the ship. It is immediately accepted. He's finally able to go to the war zone. He's terrifically happy. He goes to a destroyer. And once he's there off Okinawa fighting the war, he finally realizes how vital and important he has been to this crew and how what has really been meaningful was his leadership to that crew. He gets the destroyer. They don't need his leadership. They're a fighting ship. They're awesome. They're in the mission. They don't necessarily need him to buck up their morale. They know why they're there and they're fighting hard. And he realizes then how meaningful his, his service has been, how meaningful his leadership on the ship is. He sends a very, uh, you know, it's a very emotional letter to the crew. Um, and then uh, they get a second letter right afterwards that says he's been killed by a kamikaze. It's just heartbreaking, of course, in the movie. It's heartbreaking for the crew uh, to recognize the sacrifice he, he has made. Um, and so what wisdom did I gain from that? What did I take away from that? Well, one, I knew I needed to be better than Mr. Roberts in terms of actually knowing when I walked into my assignment how important this was. I think at one point in the pipeline, we were, we were being lectured by uh, – by someone who had been very much involved with all the shipyard issues over the past, gosh, 30 years. This guy was definitely an expert. He knew all the places we had made the wrong turns over the past 30 years. And when he was over talking to us, he's like, well, what do you guys think? I was like, well, I think this, this, I think it's going to suck and I'm going to have this mission. And he's like, well, captain, I think that's going to be the wrong attitude. That was, he was absolutely positively right. I needed to walk in with the attitude that this was a worthwhile and important mission. All right. But I also knew from Mr. Roberts that, you know, hey, I shouldn't sugarcoat that. All right. I, I sh- you know, the crew knew that they were not eating a sloppy Joe sandwich every day when they came to work. Um, they knew that this was pretty tough. And I knew I needed not to sugarcoat it. I needed to be down completely honest. But I also needed to make a mission of explaining to the sailors from the moment I took command how important this mission is, why it was worthwhile. Um, and that unlike Mr. Roberts, who needed to have the whole movie to get to this epiphany, I needed to be like his mentor, Doc, in the movie, who says, what you are doing here, Ashley, in many ways contributes more to the war. You are more in the war doing the job you are doing here than you would be anywhere else. And 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 Doug Roberts doesn't, doesn't understand that until the end. And I needed to get that message across to the crew from the get-go. Uh, I also learned, hey, what are the ways that you do? What is the mental attitude you have to bring? Uh, to leading sailors in a mission that they they don't necessarily want to have. And I think, um, you know, that was about, you know, once again, Mr. Roberts gave me some thoughts there about quality of life, trying to maximize that while also building professional pride. I, I don't think the movie does a good enough job touching on how good the crew is at doing their jobs. They might not like it, but they are good. And I, and I recognize that professional pride was important for keeping a crew going. And that was something Mr. Roberts taught me as well. Yeah. And then the last oh, Important thing I learned that I internalized from the movie was that uh, you know that that ultimately it's you, you're it's about accomplishing the mission, uh, but in a tough mission like this, you know, getting the crew to follow you, getting the crew to earning their loyalty and their respect along the way is perhaps more worthwhile and more significant and more valuable than any award 
you get. And, you know, I wrote in the article, uh, you know, at the end of the, near the end of the movie, he gets this uh, handmade award from the crew, the order of the palm for throwing the captain's hated palm tree overboard. Um, and it's really, it re actually is though their way of saying, thank you for taking care of us. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you for how you made us the best crew at doing this. And, um, and I sometimes wonder, you know, hey, how would that feel to get something like that? And then when I did get something like that, a, you know, a handmade birthday card signed by every member of the crew, uh, and then all these notes just before my change of command, that, I realized how meaningful this had all been. And even though it wasn't the command tour I dreamed of, even though it wasn't the mission I, I'd hoped to do, um, I realized that leading these, these great sailors through this unbelievably challenging and demanding, draining uh, mission it was very worthwhile. And I hope, and that was the answer I tried to give to that J.O. that day. Yeah. So Joel, when you took command of Toledo, how long had the ship been in the yards in a maintenance availability? And then what were the major things going on with the ship while you had command of it? Uh, so when I took command, the ship had just arrived. And in fact, the availability had not officially started. The, the official start of availability was 16 days after my change of command. Having said that, if you ask the crew, the availability had started <laughs> about 16 days before I took command. Um, right. And, uh, you know, as soon as we moored, uh, the workers were on board, work had started, tag outs were being hung, work controls were being executed, and we were disassembling huge parts of the ship. Um, in terms of the things that we accomplished while I was in command, we dry docked the ship. We conducted a number of high consequence evolutions in the engineering plant to uh, fully refurbish it and restore it. Uh, and prepared for service. Um, and uh, we completely changed out the combat system, uh, changed out a whole bunch of the uh, interior part of the ship. I mean, essentially with the exception of refueling uh, the reactor, an engineered overhaul is as complete a refurbishment of the submarine as we can do. We do it uh, twice in the life of a 688 at the 10 year points. Um, so the ship can get to 30 plus years of service. And it, it is, a you know, you pretty much rip the entire submarine apart from the from the inside and put it back together. Uh, you know, for a lot of my command tour, the bow dome was off. Uh, the rudder was completely removed. The screw was off. The stern planes were off. And uh, it was very, very interesting to get, see that all taken apart and then see them all put on. I mean, at the end of my tour, when I, when I left, of course, the, the ship had finally had the, pretty much all the hull cuts put back in. The bow was back on. The rudder was back on. The screw was back in. Um, and so you could really see the ship coming back together uh, as I was getting ready to leave. Wow. And uh, so so Toledo was at the 20 year point when you took command, roughly. She was really closer to the 20 uh, to the 25 year point. Uh, in fact, um, she was past the 25 year point. We're actually uh, in terms of commissioning. Uh, we are now at the 30 year point for the ship. Wow. And uh, so now that she's been really rebuilt, uh, she'll be back at sea, hopefully within another year or so, and, and yes. then serve, serve for another, what do you think, five, 10 years? Absolutely. I think uh, we've got another five, maybe 10 years on that ship. She's, she's got a lot of mileage still to go, and she's a great ship uh, with a great crew. Awesome. So the second piece that you wrote for us this month, which is online only for our readers, uh, it's titled The Bridge on the River Kwai, Essential Viewing for Leaders at the Shipyard. And so the movie, The Bridge on the River Kwai, came out in 1957. It won seven Oscars, including Best Picture. Uh, for our listeners who haven't seen it, yeah, just give us a quick plot summary and describe some of the lessons for a Navy ship or submarine crews uh, going into maintenance. Yeah, I'm sure that uh, I'm sure that some viewers uh, <laughs> might be a little taken aback that I think The Bridge over the River, on the River Kwai is the movie to watch for going to the shipyard. Uh, I, I think maybe about a year into command, uh, we were doing some training. I was showing some clips from, uh, I think, Down Periscope, uh, another great leadership movie. And, you know, uh, we were talking about realistic submarine movies. And I think one of my sailors asked me, hey, what do I think is the best movie for a submarine in the shipyard? And I thought about it for a few minutes and the bridge on the River Kwai came to mind. Um, and I'm not sure that's a, not sure that's a great thing. Um, but there are a lot of, I think, truths about the shipyard experience that the movie captures and a lot of leadership lessons that I think leaders in the shipyard can use to to improve the experience for sailors and execute their availabilities better um the, the movie is about a uh, a group of british prisoners of war a british battalion that surrendered at the fall of singapore in 1942 in early 1943 they march into a camp in the middle of burma uh and where they are tasked with building a bridge over the river kwai 
Uh, the British colonel uh, quickly uh, has a, a, a contest of wills with the Japanese colonel in charge of the camp. Uh, I would split the movie into three phases. There's phase one where there's the contest of wills between the two colonels. Um, and even though the British colonel is the prisoner, he ultimately triumphs over the Japanese colonel played by Sesu Hayakawa, uh, who came out of retirement for this film. And I just think it's a masterful, both of them. Uh, and, and the British colonel is played by Alec Guinness, who most viewers know as Obi-Wan Kenobi later on in the Star Wars movies. Uh, but a masterful portrayal of different leadership styles um, and how even though Alec Guinness gets locked up in a, uh, in a metal oven for a good part of the movie, uh, he still maintains the loyalty and earns even the respect, I think, of his Japanese guards for his refusal to break and how he uh, stands up under torture. Um, having won his battle with the Japanese colonel, phase two of the movie is uh, Colonel Nicholson realizing, and, and, and this is the phase that I think is most applicable to, to, to leaders in the shipyard, realizing, hey, my battalion's uh, morale and discipline has fallen apart. Um, I want to maintain them as a unit. Uh, I want to you know, maximize their, uh, their quality of life, but also their self-discipline and value. And so he decides that the project to accomplish that is building the bridge for the Japanese and building it even better than the Japanese would have built it. And I think uh, most of us recognize that's a pretty gross violation of the code of conduct. And uh, he completely loses perspective. And, uh, you know, at one point, one of his officers does try to get him back, uh, you know, in the box by saying, do we really have to build as good a bridge as we're building? Uh, shouldn't we build a lousy bridge? Because that's, and, you know, Colonel Nicholson, Jet Al Guinness's character is, of course, completely lost perspective. And, and you know, to the point that he actually has a very pivotal conference with the Japanese where they reveal to the Japanese that the Japanese are building the bridge in the wrong place. The bridge will never be able to be built where they're building it. Uh, they're building out of the wrong materials. They're, they have the wrong design. The British, you know, completely take over the project from the Japanese who just kind of stand back and just are amazed as the British, uh, build a bridge on time under budget and, uh, and, and, and with great, uh, you know, engineering skill. Um, that's phase two of the movie. Phase three of the movie is where all the excitement is where a British commando team, uh, unaware of how hard their, their countrymen are doing. Uh, building this bridge, parachute into Burma with the mission of blowing up the bridge, uh, led, of course, by an American in order to get Hollywood uh, to finance the movie, uh, played by William Holden. Um, and at the end, they uh, they do end up building, the, blowing up the bridge. Old movies that you never would see made today because they actually built a real bridge for the movie. They run a real train over the bridge and blow it up with the train going over the bridge. I mean, it's completely real. Uh, you know, the people in the village uh, nearby when they made this movie just couldn't believe it. They're like, well, this is a really good bridge. And they blew it up just for this movie. It's very strange. So those are the three phases of the movies. The things that I think leaders can take away uh, from the movies. First off, understanding the sailor's experience in the shipyard. Uh, one, a lot of sailors feel they are a, um, they're an extra labor force for the shipyard when they get there. Uh, yeah, and, and I understand why they feel that way. I understand why the shipyard sometimes uh, might feel that way about them too. All right. We will have sailors 24 seven on the ship. Uh, the duty session is always going to be there and the shipyard tries to work three shifts and, uh, you know, more often than not, they'll come down on second shift wanting to get some work done. They will need ships for support for that. And I can't count the number of times as a junior officer, as a department head in the shipyard where, uh, I, you know, was being woken up uh, you know, late in the day, uh, as I was trying to get to sleep before my evening tours or my, uh, my midnight tour, it was like, Hey, we have shipyard workers who need support with hanging these tags, or they need support with removing this interference. And, uh, that would be really frustrating for the crew. And it would create a lot of animosity between the crew and the shipyard. Uh, cause if it was planned, if it was something that we were told about with enough notice, we could have sailors standing by, we would either bring in people late, we would figure out a way to to uh, have people standing by, but when it wasn't planned and it was being done on the backs of our sailors on the duty section, um, I mean, these were, you know, normally our duty sections are pretty small. Um, even in three section, if you, you know, like you, you can drop your crew down to three section, uh, but you might be doing that because you've sent a lot of sailors to ride other ships. Uh, and so it's not, you, you don't necessarily have a lot of extra sailors in the section when you go to three section. And so even in three section, it can be very challenging uh, to support that extra work that the shipyard will sometimes ask for. So, so sailors sometimes feel they're an expansion volume uh, for poor planning by their shipyard partners. All right. And, uh, and in the article, I, I compared the amount of time the average shipyard worker who's unionized will spend in the shipyard in the industrial area. That's about 
of their time during an average work week where they don't work Saturdays or Sundays. The average sailor who's standing three session duty uh, will spend at least 49% of their time in the industrial area in the same week. All right, that's a pretty significant amount. Um, and uh, so that that's one of the lessons I, you know, I think viewers can take and recognize, hey, sailors, you know, really feel that they're doing a lot of work and this is a very much, you know, as an unpaid labor force. I think another lesson is the commute. Um, I think, uh, you yeah, know, I, I recently had a leader, uh, you know, at a shipyard when he showed up, we were giving him uh, some indoctrination about what was going to happen. And he asked a really insightful, good question. That was the right question to ask. He's like, where does this, where does sailors park? And I think, uh, you know, every shipyard I've ever been at, the parking is terrible. Um, and, uh, you know, I, as a J.O., I think there were times where I walked more than a mile to get to the ship because there's just no nearby parking. Um, department head, I definitely wrecked my car trying to park in one of these two small parking spots. Um, and, uh, you know, definitely had to pay, you know, for that and the damage I did to the other person's car. Uh, you know, once again, trying to find a spot that was anywhere reasonably close uh, to the ship to get to it and not have to do, you know, and it was still going to be a 10 to 15 minute walk from where I was parking just to get to yeah. the ship. And and the, the parallel with the movie is that the uh, the British POWs are are marching every day to the side of the bridge. Right, they're building this bridge, but they they've got a they're long they've got a long commute too, right? They do, and I and I mean and, and the commute that really comes to mind when I think in the movie is the commute at the beginning when they get off the train in the middle of the jungle and they have to trek all the way to their prisoner of war camp, and by the time they've made it, the soles are coming off of some of the soldiers' shoes. Uh, they look completely dirty, ragged, and tired. And so to, you know, and so I compare that to uh, the commute that you read about in the George Washington investigation, right? Now, this has to be like, what these sailors went through has to be one of the worst things I, I can imagine where they were getting up usually three hours, maybe more before they had to show for duty. Uh, they would have to drive through Hampton Roads traffic to get to a parking lot. Sometimes uh, on the south side of the river, away from Newport News, the park near a near a, uh, a shopping mall uh, where the Navy had gotten parking, where they would then take a shuttle, which then had to fight their way through traffic, getting to Newport News. So that might be another hour uh, in the shuttle, then to get dropped off at a faraway parking lot just to walk to the ship, which was another 10 to 15 um, minutes of walking. And so, I mean, I compare that to my commute when I worked in D.C. as a, uh, as a staff officer, and I was like, oof, that's worse. Uh, yeah. And I mean, sailors doing that every day to come in for a, a day where they don't know when they're going to go home, right? I mean, like you might be done, you know, like 14, 1500 thinking you're about to leave. And then, yeah, that second shift of workers shows up and said, hey, can we get some help? And uh, and suddenly for the good of the mission, you're staying late. Uh, and then you're having to get, you know, do the commute to go home. And the traffic sometimes doesn't get better no matter how late it is. Um so I, I got a lot out of the out of that part, comparing it to the commute that my, many of my sailors had to make when I was a in command and and in my other tours, and that I still see in many shipyards. Um, and then the other part I took away was that I, you know, Colonel Nixon might not have been a good prisoner of war, but he was an outstanding partner uh, to his Japanese partners in terms of making this bridge. He shows exactly the sort of ownership and forward leaning. Uh, uh, responsibility that we want our leaders to have when working with their project partners to execute these things on time. And then, and, and, and I, I think I had said already one final thing, but well, all right, finally, one last thing about bridge over the river quiet in comparison to the shipyard experience. I love the scene in the movie where they had the conference between the Japanese and the British, where the British are explaining how they're building the bridge in the wrong spot and all that. I can't tell you how many shipyard meetings I have gone to that felt like that conference. Uh, not necessarily because us Navy guys had, were, were smarter and better and knew better. It was just because uh, it felt the same way because we spoke different languages. That even though these are you know, fellow Americans, we all speak English, uh, you know, it sometimes feels like a completely different language when you do a shipyard meeting. Uh, mm -hmm. They're talking about earned value and BQWP and ACDs and ERs. And you're just like, you know, I can't, you know. I've been doing this now, this, you know, like gosh, maybe five tours now that have had significant shipyard time. And I still lean over to some of my uh, more shipyard savvy uh, shipmates and say, what does that mean? What is that? What is that? <laughs> what is they that? Got what they is got that? a whole different set of acronyms. huh? It, it, I mean, it's just a completely different language, a completely different culture as well. I mean, you might have former submariners, former Navy people or active duty Navy 
uh, on the shipyard side of things, and they have a completely different outlook, a uh, completely different approach to things because uh, it is a completely different life at that point, being on that side of the maintenance mission and not being assigned to a ship's crew. And so uh, uh, sometimes I, you know, I felt like at least when I was in command, I had to do like a court. I had like a quarterly uh, uh, reminder to my shipyard partners about like what it was like to be in the duty section, who they should really be talking to, who could actually say no from ship's force. Um, Cause I never forget. And they would sometimes think that, uh, you know, a second class petty officer would be the person they should integrate with to do a major, evolution and uh well i had many awesome second class petty officers working for me uh at the end of the day they were not the eoh coordinator they were not the engineer and they certainly weren't me gotcha yeah um tell us about uh maybe one or two of your best days in command um i think i you know there's three things that come to mind when i think about my best days in command uh you know i was on this podcast two years ago talking about firefighting and uh, I think, uh, you know, some of my best days in command when, we, when my crew would do integrated fire drills with our partners in the shipyard. Uh, it was a, it's a very challenging skill set. And uh, I was very proud of how hard and how well my sailors had trained to be able to fight fires from only the duty section. That we got to the point that uh, I could pick any 20 sailors uh, from the crew. Uh, at any time, led by maybe one officer, one chief, and a more senior uh, petty officer. And uh, with those three leaders and the other 20 sailors, they could fight a fire that normally most boats would need a whole crew uh, to try and deal with. And would uh, and we'd be fighting with some very senior leadership to include the X XO trying to be on the deck plate. And so uh, seeing us do that, um, you know, early in my command tour, we did a major fire drill from the 8010 Industrial Ships uh, Safety Manual. Uh, with uh, mutual aid from all around uh, the shipyard area. Uh, we were looking at a lot of reports from previous ships in different shipyards, and they had all had a lot of problems maintaining agent on their simulated fire. Uh, and, uh, you know, if one ship, uh, I remember like, you know, there's a couple ships where it was in the, uh, you know, over 10 minutes. Uh, I was like, ooh, they might have actually lost a real ship if they had had, you know, if that was a real fire. And so when we went and we did it and uh, the crew uh, just knocked it out of the park and the maximum time that we had no agent on the fire was only three seconds. And I remember when I told the crew about that gap, it was only three seconds. And I remember they all cheered so loud because uh, they had worked so hard to accomplish that. And to uh, and so I was those were always good days to see how all that training and that teamwork between the crew and the shipyard paid off. And that was very, very validating, very gratifying. Um, I think one of my next other really great days uh, was this fight club uh, that I wrote about. We, you know, we got tapped to be an evaluated trainer by the aggressor squadron uh, for the submarine force. And it was a high end uh, fight uh, in the trainer. My sailors had only had about 40 hours on the new combat system that we were going to be using for this trainer. So I recognized we were going in under trained, uh, under, uh, you know, not with, without a lot of experience and proficiency. And uh, before we did that, we, we sat together in the room from the, we had the most junior members of the team all there. And we brainstormed our, our battle plan and how we were going to, uh, you know, what it most likely was going to look like, how we planned to fight, what tactics we wanted to use. Uh, we agreed that we weren't ever going to, you know, we weren't ever going to disengage. We were just going to keep fighting and, uh, and we were going to see how long it lasted. <laughs> you know, and see how well we did. And uh, when it was all over, it was four hours of chaos. Um, and we just kept shooting torpedoes and uh, kept running and uh, ducking and weaving and uh, throwing a lot of punches. Uh, and when it was all over, I um, I could tell some of the guys felt kind of down and I was ready, I was ready to jump in and give them my talk about, hey, this is amazing. We only were at 40, 50 hours of time on this combat system. And look how, how, how well we did. When one of the aggressor squadron evaluators jumped in and said, hey, can I talk first? And he said, that was amazing. And, uh, you know, he just told them, you know, like, we, you know, we have a lot of crews who are extremely proficient, a lot of at sea experience, you know, they're coming straight in from deployment and uh, they were not nearly as aggressive. They weren't nearly as, uh, you know, willing to stay with the fight as you, as you guys were. And I, you know, I mean, those guys, you know, I, I think we rode off that for a year. Everybody felt 10 feet tall. Yeah. Uh, it was pretty amazing. I, that was one of my other, you know, best days. And, and it's an important mission to ship is maintaining the readiness to go to sea. And I talk about that in both articles that while we're trying to, you know, while we support the maintenance mission, the primary duty of, of the captain and the sailors, the crew is to, is to maintain readiness for combat operations and going to sea. And that is a 
very hard skill set to maintain in the shipyard. Um, it requires a lot more time, a lot more work, and uh, it requires a lot of uh, a lot more training in many ways. You can't just go and get the reps by going, you know, on standing watch. You have to come up with more creative ways to train your sailors uh, when they're not at sea on rise. Yeah, and you're also you're also managing a, a schedule of sending your sailors and officers to other boats, right? That are getting underway, either to get their own calls or keep their calls. Uh, or to augment the manning of other uh, submarines that that have to go do a mission, and and that's a challenge as well. It absolutely was, and I, I, I would tell you that, um, uh, you know, we never, I never felt we had all the manning that we really wanted to have. There were a couple divisions that always seemed to be a little bit short, uh, but you know, it was absolutely essential that we get every sailor on a ride of sufficient duration that they could come back feeling that they truly understood what going to sea was like and feeling qualified. Um, at the more senior levels, it could be kind of pernicious. Uh, you know, I mean, it, it really hurts sending my XO away for, for a long duration. Uh, it really hurts sending my uh, navigator away for a long duration, and even my engineer. Um, you know, get, getting it, I mean, they needed to get those rides. It was good for their, for their, professional, uh, for their professional growth. It was important for their uh, careers. Uh, but it did hurt the ship and hurt us. Uh, to do that. Um, but we had to do those things and, you know, trying to make that depth in the bench that you could send those people on rides and still accomplish the maintenance mission and still uh, also continue the readiness mission. Those are both very unbelievably challenging things. Uh, yeah. to do. When you uh, say a, a long ride, are, are you talking like your XO going off to another boat for 45 days, 90 days? Like what, what, what would be? Uh, it, it was about two and a half months. Wow. Yep. And, uh, you know, during that time, I also had uh, one of my department heads on a different boat. And so it was, uh, you know, it was my uh, one remaining uh, tactical uh, department head was my acting XO, in addition to running all the forward departments. And uh, it was me and the, and the engineer. And uh, <laughs> that was a bit it for the senior officers on the boat. Yeah, that's, that's challenging, especially when you've got, as you pointed out earlier, you know, you've got the ind industrial partners, the shipyard coming on and off, wanting to schedule things. Hey, we got to take this apart. We got to, you know, work on this. Uh, we need sailors to stay late to, you know, to help us out with with uh, this or that, and all of that, you know, impacts as you said morale. It impacts um, how tired the crew can get. I, I want to touch because you you brought it up. I just want to remind people of the podcast we did with you, and and it was uh, you had a co-author as well who was a surface ship captain, but I think the the article was titled "Every Sailor a Firefighter." In that episode a couple of years ago, you, know, you you talked about the the problem, especially in in an industrial in a maintenance availability um, when you're in the shipyards. There's a lot of hot work, so just touch on that again for a minute for people who maybe haven't been in that that shipyard industrial environment. Just what are some of the the real threats of uh, of fire on a ship or on a submarine in the yard? Um, there are a lot, and uh, and actually this kind of touches on the worst day I had in command, which is the converse of my best day. Uh, is that uh, you get a lot of temporary systems put through the ship. You have to have temporary ventilation because your ventilation is gone. You have scaffolding all over the place so that workers can get to uh, various systems and disassemble them and put them together, refurbish them. Um, and so a submarine is already a tight space, and now imagine it clogged with uh, ventilation, piping, scaffolding. Um, and like you said, we're doing hot work. There's grinding. There's welding uh, going on, uh, cutting of different metals. Um, you know, there's there's welding that doesn't even have to do with actually getting the ship back to sea. It's welding so they can put pad eyes in, so they can lift out giant pumps and other major components. Um, and then the thing that really makes a shipyard dangerous in terms of firefighting is that it gets dirty. And uh, this is one of the things that also just completely drains uh, a crew's morale is they have to spend a lot of time cleaning. And even though the shipyard partners should be better about cleaning up after themselves. Uh, that's one of those things where the sailors need to be on the deck plate and they need to work with their shipyard partners to to stop them sometimes when they finish a job and they're about to leave and say, no, you do need to clean up. Because when they don't, yeah, we need to clean that. We can't have a dirty ship because when you do, you know, it's okay to have some sparks escape a hot work uh, confinement and they just touch metal and that's it. Uh, it's worse when those sparks get out of a hot work confinement and they find uh, some trash that's on the deck, that trash ignites, and then that manages to ignite uh, some other materials that shouldn't be in the ship. Um, and now next thing you know, you've got a fire like Blown Home Richard, Miami, Normandy. Uh, and so keeping the ship clean is a significant challenge in the yard because it creates a lot of debris. It creates a lot of trash. 
Um, and human beings are lazy. They don't like to clean. And that goes for the shipyard workers as well as as many sailors. It's a challenge. Um, and my worst day in command had everything to do with this, where I had a sailor who was, we were showing how difficult it was to traverse parts of our engine room due to the scaffolding and the temporary piping. I uh, asked the sailor to go into a certain spot, recognize it was challenging. Uh, and he, uh, trying to get there wearing a uh, firefighting ensemble and self-contained breathing apparatus, he dislocated his knee. Um, and that was a terrible spot for that to happen. We had to, uh, we brought in the fire department. We spent uh, about an hour or two hours removing scaffolding, cutting that FFE off of him, injecting morph morphine into him, and uh, having to uh, tie him down on a stretcher and then maneuver him through a uh, through all this taken apart engine room to get him to a hull cut and then put him on a crane and get him out of the dry dock to the emergency room. And uh, wow, well, without a doubt, the worst two hours of my command tour. Uh, calling his parents. Uh, when it was over to explain to him that I, yes, I had sent him into the spot. He was injured because of me. Uh, I was uh, just without a doubt, the most um, humbling and uh, terrible thing I, uh, I could imagine. And um, I, I still feel just awful about what happened there, but you know, it, it reflected how tight and how challenging uh, the insides of our ships get in the shipyard environment. Uh, in the article I talk about, and you know, it's not just the, the fire hazard of it. It's, when the ship is not running the way it's supposed to, it gets really uncomfortable, all right? Uh, you know, temporary ventilation can only do so much. And there was a period, uh, you know, during every year in command where we would have problems with temporary ventilation for various reasons. And it could get to over 100 degrees inside the ship with accompanying humidity. And uh, we would have to figure out how to cut watches short, bring in extra people, stage water. Um, I found myself buying like little you know, boxes of, uh, with fans and cold and ice that I would, you know, have directed the watch standards. So they'd at least have something cooling them down while we try to come up with an engineered solution to the ventilation. Um, it, you know, it gets very, very, very painful and uncomfortable. And so, uh, that's another thing that, uh, once again, the bridge over requires some degree really reflected, uh, you know, you, you could, you kind of felt like you might've been in, a, in one of those ovens. You're in the hot box. Yeah. Gotcha. Uh, Joe, we're running short on time here. Uh, just a real quick. Uh, so the, the past few years, the Navy's put a lot of emphasis on getting ships and subs into and out of maintenance on time. Uh, Vice Admiral Goucher, the commander of submarine forces, wrote an article in the same issue, the October issue of, uh, of the magazine, talking about that priority uh, as one of his top priorities. Are, are things improving? Is it getting better? It's... Um you can see some signs of improvement. Okay. I, I don't want to, I don't want to lie and say that it's uh, you know, completely turning around. I think American, the American industrial base is on its back right now. All right. I mean, the issues you're seeing like at Boeing, uh, the issues you're seeing uh, in various industries across the country, uh, particularly some of the ones that are, you know, high reliability uh, organizations, you know, such as the ones that do make missiles and, spacecraft and airplanes, ships, submarines. Um, we are reaping the whirlwind of 30 years of uh, trying to seek efficiency at the sake of effectiveness, of denigrating the importance of the manufacturing sector, of emphasizing college over industrial schools and, uh, and over industrial jobs. And um, and also we are seeing what happens when a workforce that we hired in the 80s and did amazing work from the 80s through the early 10s uh, retires. Um, and you see this at every shipyard. I think you're seeing it at a lot of these industries where a lot of people who came in with the Reagan buildup are now retiring or did or retired with COVID. Um, and uh, it's been a pretty clean break. And while we probably could have handled that transition better over the past 15 years, uh, it has now happened. Yeah. And so uh, when you see a lot of these workforces, uh, you know, before it might have been like 15 people with, you know, like five pretty old experience types, five, you know, journeymen and five apprentices. Today, I would say, you know, you see one or two masters, uh, maybe one or two journeymen, and then the other 10, 11 people are all apprentices and they're still learning. And it's uh, it's going to take time. It's going to take time for us to get first time quality on a lot of these jobs, and a lot of these construction and overhaul projects. Um, this is a long haul. And uh, it's not going to immediately turn around, but uh, we are seeing signs of improvement. Uh, we are seeing um, some things where I would say um, we are finding uh, ways to train the workforces better. I'd say we are, uh, 
I, I see some signs of improvement, but at the same time, it's going to take a bit. Uh, you know, so it's um, it, it's a long haul. We got to maintain a lot of continuous pressure and uh, and recognize that this win, just like the win of getting your ship through a shipyard availability, it's about the long game and not about the immediate gratification. Yeah, I was talking to at our uh, our conference that we had yesterday. Uh, one of the topics was uh, the industrial base, defense industrial base. And, and afterwards, I was talking to a rep from uh, one of the companies that builds ships for the Navy and the Coast Guard. I, I won't identify which company, but he, he, he said that same thing, that um, that a lot of the, you know, the shipyard workers who've been, as you said, master uh, electricians or master welders uh, or pipe fitters, whatever the skill is, um, are retiring because they've they've hit the 40 year point of doing this very labor intensive work. Um, and so a lot of their, you know, you're, they're seeing supervisors suddenly be people who've been in the yards for, you know, four or five years. And uh, and so you've got you're, you're losing that uh, long term skill set and experience set. And you're trying to build the new set, the, the, the new generation, new generations of, of uh, supervisors and and master um you know ship builders and it's hard it takes time it's not a you don't, uh, you don't just turn that on quickly and it's a completely different mentality when it comes to training them all right i mean i i compare it to you know imagine like you know you're training a, or you're, you're educating high school students um and you might have a mix of senior juniors and freshmen and and, and that's something you, you you can talk at a more grown-up level and be able to expect that there's more older uh the more older teenagers will take care of the younger teenagers and all that but in the you know when you when you're really down to only like, you know, like when it's like a one to 10 ratio in terms of who's the grown up and who's the child, um, you know, it's more like being in elementary school is my comparison. And, uh, you mm -hmm. know, you teach second, third graders a lot differently than you teach a, a senior in high school. And yeah. Uh, that's also a challenge that these yards are having to code through where, uh, you know, they, they got used to training their workforce a certain way. They got used to treating their workforce a certain way. And now it's, it's different. And it's a, and I think that's uh, that's also part of turning this around is is coming up with the right training paradigm and taking care of these new workers uh, in a way that makes them feel valued and uh, helps them all grow um, and gives them all the supervision they need. And when you have a very junior supervisor, well, that's 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 even harder. Imagine having a a, chief, a guy who's made chief on his very first tour as a sailor and has stayed there and is still running your division for you. Um, maybe that's going to work out. Uh, in, World War II, in World War II, it did, but you know that's because we managed to cram so much experience in short periods of time. Um, we've got to figure out how we do that now. Yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, parting shots, saved rounds, uh, favorite movie quotes from Mr. Roberts or Bridge on the River Kwai? Uh, you know, there's one quote that didn't make it into the article that I wish had uh, from Mr. Roberts, where uh, you know Doc says to to Mr. Roberts when he's grousing about, well, maybe I'm on this ship because I'm not good enough, and Doc says. You are good enough. You just don't have the opportunity. And to my fellow shipmates who are out there who are in the yard, and you might be thinking to yourself, I'm not good enough. Well, you are. And you're just not getting that opportunity. You're doing this unbelievably important mission, uh, and it is valuable. And what you're doing is going to be so meaningful in the years down the road for the sailors who are taking those boats out to sea and winning the fights that we need to win. But we, we, we won't win those fights unless we win the maintenance fight now. And so it does matter. It is very meaningful. And you just, aren't getting that opportunity to go to sea and do the fun stuff. And I'm just as sad about it as you are, but we have to execute this mission. We do have to win. And, yeah. uh, you know, I'll leave with the words that Admiral Caldwell, our former director and naval reactor said to me very early in my command tour. Uh, he's like, this is your part of the war to win. And uh, that just meant the world. And yeah. uh, that, really, that really saw me through a lot of tough days. Got to get the boat back to sea. Boats in port don't win fights. There you go. Well, my guest today has been Captain Joel Holwit, submariner, former commanding officer of the USS Toledo. You can find his article, uh, Thanks for Everything, Mr. Roberts, and Bridge on the River Kwai uh, at usni.org. Search for uh, Mr. Roberts or River Kwai, and they pop right up. Uh, Joel, thanks for writing for us again and for taking time to be on the show. Thank you so much, Bill. It's been great to be back. All right. This episode was brought to you by Booz Allen. Accelerate today's missions with tomorrow's technologies as the leader in providing AI solutions to the federal government and one of the world's largest cybersecurity providers, Booz Allen advances game-changing capabilities rapidly, ethically, and securely 
Learn more at boozallen.com slash defense. If you're a member of the Naval Institute, thank you. And if not yet, please join us. Start receiving Proceedings Magazine, member discounts on books and newsletters. Just go to usni.org forward slash join to become a member today. And until next episode, remember, victory begins at the Naval Institute. 